So let's uh, let me give you a good gosh. Okay, Canvas. So let's talk about Canvas for a minute. So, oh, just as, just in case you didn't know, because I think this is kind of worth knowing. If you ever want, you can like change the name here if you want to. If you click over here, you can give it a different nickname and a different color if you want to. You can totally decide what you want to do. I, I, as you can maybe see, I often like to write the um, the days and times of the class on my canvas just so I see it, so I know which one I'm clicking on when I do it. Or also having the the section number there is helpful for me because I often need that piece of information. But whatever you want. Um, so co 16C. So here's the home page currently. I am going to change it to be the modules page, probably at the end of the week, just because that's the modules is where I actually think you will typically go if you're going to Canvas in this class at all, because that's where all the useful information is. So let's look back at the home page slash syllabus for just a moment. Um, lots of, I keep trying to look over here, but I'm like, it's right here. Um, so there's lots of information here that's really not all that important. It just kind of says the usual class stuff where you can find me, when my office hours are, where class is, how you can come. You can come via Zoom like people are or in person, or you can even watch the class video later. All of those are totally fine and acceptable ways of attending class. Um, let's see, let's scroll down here. I have various office hours in various places. There's some information about the class, but nothing particularly pertinent. Um, here's where class is, accommodation, right? The Zoom instructions, I feel like everyone, we all know how to use Zoom at this point, but kind of copied and pasted a few quarters in a row here. Um, attendance is probably the one thing I actually talk about. So if you are actually registered for the course, meaning you signed up for it through Schedule Builder, then if you pass the class, you'll get one unit of workload credits. Um, and all that means really is that it's one unit towards meeting your minimum requirement progress, minimum progress requirement, and also for financial aid reasons, but it doesn't count towards graduation. Um, to pass the class, you just have to attend. And to show me that you've attended, you just have to fill out the form that you've all filled out. So every time you attend, fill out the form. That's how we're going to do attendance. Um, and whether or not you're actually registered for the class or just signed up for Canvas, please do fill out the attendance form because I need to keep track of attendance for our own departmental reasons as well basically just to justify funding for things later on. Um, what else? Yeah, I think, yes, passing is 75%, so attend 75% of the time or more. Ideally, you would come every class because you're gonna learn stuff that you want to see probably, or at least maybe need to see, exactly. Um, what else? You can attend, like I said, by either coming in person during class, coming via Zoom during class or watching the video, which I will post after class sometime. I usually post the same day. If you watch it sometime later, um, that's also totally fine. As far as filling out the attendance form, just so everybody knows, so here's the attendance form. It looks like this. It's got this fun circular pattern on top to distinguish it from the other one that is not the one I want you to use. So when you fill this out, you will put in your email, your student ID number, your first and last name in that order, I would write James Parmenter, just like that. A lot of people in past quarters have written like last name first or last name comma first name. I want your first name first because that's how it's organized in Canvas for me. So it's easier that way. What class you're attending and then how you attended. And lastly, the date of the class that you were attending for. This is specifically for people who are watching the video like after the fact. So like if you were watching today's class's video, say on Thursday, you would still put the date as April 3rd, 2023. You do have to put in the year, which is kind of annoying. Um, please do put in the right year because if you don't, I have to like find it somewhere else. It's kind of, it's not like super hard to find, but it definitely gets off track. Um, so filling up the attendance form, not that hard. Please do it every time you attend class. I'll remind you or try to remind you. If I forget to remind you, you should remind me to remind you. All right. Um, and some notes. Yep. Blah, blah, blah. You can read all this later. You don't have to read all this later. It's not that required. But if you feel like you have a question about something and you think it might be there, you're welcome to look. One workload unit, blah, 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 blah. Where can you get more math help? From me and my office hours, Grant's website is a useful tool. I encourage all of you to check it out. I feel like it's not, I feel like for 16C, it's kind of a little bit lacking actually as compared to the other ones, but there's still some useful information on there. Some good practice problems and 
some solutions. I might have to write some solutions to these. Um, Grant's my coworker, by the way. He's done Grant, you've probably seen him in drop in. Sometimes people think we're the same person. I don't think we look that much alike, but whatever. Um, I mean, we don't look that dissimilar, but we don't look that much alike. Um, and then you can help in drop in as I'm, I mean, right? This is most people's third quarter of calculus. You know where the resources are at this point, but in case you don't, drop in in the library. You can get help from each other. Um, Ryan, right? Yes. Whose class are you in? Cool. And how about the folks on the Zoom? Whose class are you in? Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can. Can I even see it? I feel like I've made mistakes here. Let's see if I. Oh, where the? Hmm. I want the little chat thing. Where'd you go? I've lost it all. Oh, there we go. I have to do that. Let's see. Oh yeah, cool. Thank you, Lee. 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 Everyone's in the lead. Great. So. I'm blowing it now. Let's see, I just want like, there we go, the screen, I think. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Yes. Awesome. Um, this again. Right, you all can see that. Good. Okay. So everyone's in Lee. That's awesome that everyone's in. I doubt everyone, everyone who signed up for the class is in the same class, but so far everyone's in Lee. Um, so definitely you should all maybe try to talk to each other, get to know each other. You could be a good resource for each other. I think studying with your classmates is probably one of the best ways to be more successful in math. So I would encourage you all to come to class, not that you have to come to class in person for those of you on Zoom, but if you could come to class in person, I recommend it. I think being in person is lovely. It's nice to see people, but again, no pressure. You don't have to, but you should. Um, and it's always, it feels weird, like I'm not talking to myself on the video. I'm like, hey, you, yeah, me. Okay, um, what else? You can also make an individual appointment with me if you want to. I don't have very many this quarter. The only time I have available is every day from, like from 3.40 to 4.10. So if that time works for you, if you want to see me, you can make an appointment on Calendly. You just click this link and then it shows you when I'm available. So the, right, at 3.40 or hey, at 3.40, oh, guess what? Three, oh, I guess on Fridays I have more time. Fridays I'm also, oh, no, I, uh, every, ooh, I, better, I better check that. That might not actually be available. I'm gonna have to check my schedule. Oh no, I, yeah. Every other Friday, I have time from 11 to 12 as well, because we have an every other week meeting on Friday. So every other Friday, you could also see me. All right, so that's kind of just the boring, whatever, logistics stuff. Check it out if you want to, but not super required. Just make sure you fill the attendance form. And then as far as actually getting useful information, the model homepage by the end of the week um, is going to be where you're going to go. Let me change to the student view. This evaluation will be available at the end of the quarter. I would Appreciate you all filling it out when it's available. Let's go to your view. So some useful links, the class attendance form, the class Zoom, my office hours, my... So I did actually teach a 16 CCO class last quarter um, as well. So I'm very, I'm as, as familiar with the material as I've ever been because I just did it all. Not like I'm not, but just like, oh yeah, it's very fresh in my mind. So you can watch the videos from my last quarter when Varn was teaching it. I think he did a good job teaching. I think the questions were good. Um, you can also see the class notes from last quarter. These this will also have the current quarter videos and notes once I post them. So today sometime, they'll be there as well. Other websites, Kuba. Um, oh, I know I was going to ask. What's Lee's, has he talked about what he's going to do for homework? Optional. optional, great. I mean, not great, really. I think that's not great personally. It's. I think it's, good to have homework being required just because then you'll actually have to do it. So um, I would certainly encourage you to do the homework that is assigned, even if it's optional. But if you're looking for more work, I do think Kuba's 16C website offers a lot of good additional problems. Um, if you go to his website and then scroll down a little bit, there's some, there's all sorts of nice things here, but there are problems that he's picked out from the book. And then if you click on the scan problems, you don't happen to have the textbook easily available. You can see all the problems right there, which I think is, that's actually often where I go. I'm like, oh, I need to see what that problem was in the book. I'll go to his website because it's just easier than finding it anywhere else. Um, yeah, so I think if you're looking for more practice, that's a good, good place to get more practice. And also, oh, I just unclicked on it. I believe, let me double check now. Sorry, I know I was just there. I think he's posted solutions as well. Maybe that's a lie. I was hoping it wasn't a lie. Mm, darn it. Let's go, let's go back to his. I just want to see one thing, because if there's solutions, I feel like that's extra helpful. 
let's double check. So here's his main page. Nope, yeah. He doesn't seem to have the 16 series. How disappointing. Well, that said, if you're working on a problem and you have a question about it, you're always welcome to come ask me. But like, James, I think I solved this right, but I don't actually know. And then back to the modules. Oh, that's then we can actually do some math. Um, these are some old video lessons that we have recorded. They're all short. So if you're looking for a specific video on some sort of topic that me or Grant or Sarah or Claire or Jen has made, those are also decent. And then eventually there will be handouts and some exam prep materials here. I feel like there were. They're just hidden from me now. Let's see. Let's leave the student view and see what happens. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, there's nothing there yet. Okay, great. That's totally fine. So I will also put the class recordings and class notes here in Canvas. So you can either go to YouTube and watch it if you want to, or go just to Canvas and watch it. Either way, it doesn't actually matter. Um, I think that's about it as far as Canvas. I will mark your attendance. So here's what I'm saying. If you are registered for the course, meaning you signed up via schedule builder, you are trying to get a unit for it. I will mark your attendance in Canvas. If you're not signed up for the course, I still want you to fill out the attendance form, but I'm not going to mark your attendance because it doesn't matter to you. Um, yeah. You sign up for the course, not going to the schedule. So, sure. Sorry, say, 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 say one more time. I just don't want to like all that. Sure. Time. So what you can do is you can, if you're signed, if you're registered for the course on schedule, you can drop it and then you can, you can, you can really just say words. You can just say, hey, James, can you add me to Canvas? That the, so the only difference between between being added to Canvas and being registered for the course is literally the one unit. Being added to Canvas has all the same access. You're welcome to come to class just like you are currently. You're just not getting a unit for it. Um, and the way you would do that if you were not going to just ask me in person or send me an email later, which is probably what I'll actually ask you to do, is you would go to the um, ATC website. And you scroll down to the courses we offer. And then for 16C, you can either use the CRN 61594, or you can fill out the registration form. Filling out that registration form, put it on a list, and then I add the person like later that day. So that's how. Yeah. Um, other questions from either, let me see, let me get the chat back up here so I can see it. Cool. Any questions? I'm going to change the, the, this back to the other view. Cool. Oops, oops. Ah, there you go. Um, what else? There was something else I was going to say. Occasionally I make mistakes. Let me know if you think you see a mistake. I don't try to make mistakes, but you know, everyone makes mistakes. Um, also, my, my penmanship is legible, but sometimes gets less legible. So if you need clarification on something I've written, please don't, I don't, you won't hurt my feelings. I know my handwriting is mediocre at best. Please let me know. My four might look like an eight. My letter might look like a number. I don't know. Or I might have just literally thought of the letter the number two while I was writing the letter T and wrote down the right. And sometimes it just happens. So if you think something looks funky, let me know. I will certainly clarify any mistakes or errors I may have made if I'm aware that they're there. Um, I should share my screen to make sure. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So everyone should be able to see paper here. Got some pens. Pens, pens, where'd you go, pens? And my notes. Cool. So what is a differential, oh, I should, yeah, what is a differential equation? Because I'm, yeah, that's what everyone talked about today. Co 16C, today is April 3rd, 2023. Differential equations. Um, so very generally, a differential equation is an equation involving a function 
or one of its or, and or one or more of its derivatives. So for example, this equation dy dx equal to x to the fifth plus four times the square root of x plus three over five x squared plus e to the seven x plus secant squared of three x is a differential equation. It has a function, actually it doesn't actually have the function here. It has the derivative of a function, the derivative of y, and some of the variables it depends on, x's. There could be multiple derivatives of it. It could be a second derivative or a third derivative or just the function itself. And the idea behind the differential equation is that when you solve a differential equation, a differential equation, the solution is the function. So the solution, which we're going to find, is going to be y equal to some function of x. that makes this equation true. Let me ask you too in class, how is, can you see what's on the board pretty well? It's not like too washed out or anything? Okay, great. Um, this one's pretty easy to solve because everything on the right-hand side is all functions of X to start with. So really here's what this says. It says the derivative of Y is equal to this function. So you could find Y by taking the anti-derivative of this function. But there's kind of a process we use where we're specifically doing quote unquote differential equations, where we first, if we can, we do what's called separation of variables, where we take, we put all the y's on one side or whatever the output is, and all the x's or whatever the input variable is on the other side. So here, what that means specifically is I'm going to multiply both sides by dx. Grab a red pen, which I know feels kind of weird because. We always kind of talk about how dy dx isn't really a fraction, right? It's a derivative. But I will tell you, because we do it all the time, we treat dy dx in all ways like it is a fraction. We do all the things you might do with the fraction, something over something. We multiply by the denominator, we do other weird things, we flip it over. Like it's it's even though it's not a fraction, we're going to treat it like a fraction all the time. So we're going to multiply by dx. And we're going to end up getting dy on the left equal to all this stuff. And since I know I'm going to anti-differentiate, I'm also going to simplify this stuff to make it easier to anti-differentiate. So I'm going to write this as x to the fifth plus four times x to the one half plus three fifths times x to the negative second plus e to the seven x plus secant squared of three x. I guess we've got to move around a little bit. Yeah. How many don't move around enough? Let's go out. Then, of course, the dx over here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to anti differentiate or integrate both sides. So, we're going to do the integral of dy equal to the integral or anti derivative of x to the fifth plus 4x to the one half plus 3 fifths x to the negative second plus e to the 7x plus secant squared of 3x. Dx. So the idea is to get all the y's on one side and all the x's on the other side so that we can then anti-differentiate both sides and not have any weird variables crossing over to the other side. Um, if you like, you can say this is the integral of one times dy to make it a little easier to figure out what you're doing there. But the antiderivative of one is just y. I should say the antiderivative of one with respect to y is just y, whereas it goes with respect to x and x. And then over here, we're just going to use all our usual antiderivative rules. The antiderivative of x to the fifth is x to the sixth over six. And then we're going to get four times. The antiderivative of x to the one half is two thirds times x. I, that's, that's a lie. It's not a lie. The lie is I would never say it that way. I would say it's x to the three halves and then divided by three halves and multiplied by two thirds. I would do the multiplying part second because I'm always thinking about the power first. Um, same deal here. I would get three fifths times x to the negative one divided by negative one. And then ooh, e to the seven x. I know it's been a couple of weeks since we've done this, but 
When you integrate e to a multiple of x, you get e to the seven x divided by that multiple of x. And the same deal for secant squared of three x. We know the antiderivative of secant squared of x is tangent of x. So the, anti the antiderivative of secant squared of three x is gonna be tangent of three x divided by three. And then of course, plus c. I don't feel a need to simplify this at all. You could do a little simplifying, right? You could say that's eight thirds, 10 x to the three halves. You could say that's a negative three fifths, 10 x to the negative one. And yeah, but I think that's good enough that we don't need to rewrite the whole thing just to do those couple things. So that's our answer. That is the solution to this differential equation. And it's y equal to some function of your independent variable x. They're gonna get hard. But th that's really kind of straightforward when you just have the derivative in terms of the independent variable x. Questions so far? It's okay if you don't have questions, but also good to see. Let's look at a harder one. Let's look at one where you've got stuff all mixed up together. Let's see, we have dy dx equal to x cubed divided by y squared times one plus x to the fourth. So I will tell you in this class specifically, we only really ever cover two methods of solving differential equations. And one of them is the method we're talking about right now, which is called separation of variables. Later on, we'll talk about the other method, which is called first order linear differential equations. Um, which involves an integrating factor. But that's kind of it. So when you're trying when you're trying to solve a differential equation, you really only got two ways to go. So here, when I look at this, if we're going to separate the variables, when that when we say separate, what we really mean is you're going to put all of one type on one side and all the other type on the other side. Some people like to do this thing where they say when you're separating variables, you should be able to write your derivative dy dx as a function of x times a function of y, which we totally could do here, right? You could, if you really wanted to, write this as dy dx equal to x cubed over one plus x to the fourth times one over y squared, a function of x times a function of y. But there's no real need to do that. Really, what we're trying to get to is where the y's are on. So I'm going to say something that's, that is always going to be true in this class. The y's are always going to be on the left because we're almost always writing as dy dx equals some stuff. And if that's the case, you want the dy to remain in the top. So the y's are always going to end up on the left side, and then the x's are always going to end up on the right side. Because what has to happen to be able to make this work is the dy and the dx have to both not be in the denominator. So since dx is in the denominator here, it needs to come up over here. So we could say, okay, well, dy is gonna equal x cubed over one plus x to the fourth times one over y squared times dx. Oh, but I saw this one over y squared over here, so I better multiply both sides by y squared as well. So I'm gonna say y squared times dy is equal to x cubed over one plus x to the fourth dx. And now we are at the stage where we have fully separated the variables. All the y's on the left, all the x's on the right, and all the d whatever's in the numerator, for lack of a better word, or not in the denominator. And then I feel like it feels always kind of silly to write this stuff again, and I kind of like to write it again. Then we're going to anti differentiate both sides. And this is the stage where you might have to employ some of the methods of integration that we learned last quarter, like doing a use of or integration by parts or some of the other, right? It's all fair game. Definitely use of integration by parts will show up. Um, partial fractions also could. Usually it's the first two, but other things can happen. But we're trying to not make these problems super duper hard. Just, you know. So then we're going to anti-differentiate. So now we're not just going to get y on the left. We're going to get the antiderivative of y squared, which is y cubed over three. Yeah, and I'll, oh, I could have done that last bit, fine. And then equal to 
So here, this integral is definitely a u sub, right? If we think about this, we're going to have u equal to 1 plus x to the fourth. My du is going to be 4x cubed dx. And then I'm a fan of solving for what I have. So I see an x cubed times dx. So I'd like to get rid of this 4 here. So I would say 1 fourth du is equal to x cubed dx. So then this is going to end up being the integral of 1 fourth times du over u. Right, my x cubed dx is 1 fourth du, my denominator is u, and we know that the integral of 1 over u du is right, the natural log of the absolute value of u. So we're then getting that y cubed over 3 is equal to 1 fourth the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, which is really going to give us y cubed over 3 equal to 1 fourth the natural log of the absolute value of 1 plus x to the fourth plus c. Okay, a few things. A question, yeah. I was hoping you would ask that question. Excellent. So we totally could. Um, so instead of doing this, we could have said, right, I'm going to have y cubed plus c1 equal to, oh, I didn't ask, I'm sure, yeah. Plus c1 equal to that plus c2. We could totally have a c on both sides, but the thing is, we don't need to because we can subtract the C1 over to the other side. And then this new C over here, that's really C2 minus C1. So that new constant is really just the difference of those constants. So typically, it's always going to be the case where we like to put the plus C on the side with the X's because we're trying to isolate Y or solve for Y. You won't always be able to solve for Y. Most of the time we won't, but sometimes we won't. Here we totally can. Um, a couple things to observe here. One plus x to the fourth is always positive. Right, x to the fourth, doesn't matter what you put in, positive or negative, it's gonna be a positive number. So we don't actually need the opposite values there. We can change those to parentheses. You'll see a lot of solutions manuals do that when they can. You'll be like, why did they go from absolute value to not? It's because the stuff inside is already always positive. Um, and then we're gonna solve for y. So check this out. This is where things get a little bit I just want to say weird, just we have to be careful. So I'm going to multiply both sides by three. Okay, so I'm going to get y cubed equal to three fourths natural log of parentheses one plus x to the fourth plus, I'm not going to write three times c. What I'm going to do instead is say, well, three times a constant is still a constant. If you like, and I will for this one, I'm going to use some labeling so that we can see that things are different, but not that different. So this T here is really my third constant. And then when I multiply three times that constant, I'm going to get a new constant, C4. I'm just calling it, but, but C4, so I'll say, right, right, we know that C3 is really equal to C2 minus C1, and that C4 is really equal to three times C3. There's no need at all to keep track of this. I just want you to be convinced that it's okay to do it. Because what your teacher is probably going to do is probably just call them all C. They're probably be like, well, that's C, and then three times C is still C. It's just a different C. But it's okay to label them with these subscripts as well. I kind of like it because it helps me keep track of what's happening. And then finally, I'm going to take the cube root of both sides to solve for Y. So I'm going to get Y equal to the cube root of all that. 3 fourths natural log of 1 plus x to the fourth plus some constant c4. And we don't know what that constant is unless we're given an initial condition which makes us have to solve for it, which we'll talk about in a minute. A um, couple things to observe here. We're not going to, but you could take the derivative of this and then say, okay, plug that in here, and then plug in y equal to that there and square it, and you would end up being able to show that the derivative is equal to x cubed divided by the function squared times one plus x to the fourth. There's no need to do that, but you could if you really, really wanted to. Yeah, right. No, we cannot keep the c outside. It's an excellent question. So 
typically when you're like multiplying both sides by something, or adding both sides, something to both sides, subtracting or dividing, like any kind of the basic um, arithmetic operations doesn't really affect the sequence. But once you start doing functions to both sides, like taking a cube root or a logarithm or making it the exponential, then the C kind of gets carried into the new space. So multiplying doesn't really matter. Multiplying, to, multiplying by a constant doesn't matter. Adding a constant, subtracting a constant, dividing by a constant. But when you start doing other things to C, it kind of gets stuck inside with that. Yeah, excellent question. It does come up actually a fair amount. What? Other questions? Daisy, Alexia, Evelyn, you are welcome to chime in with a question if you got one. Let's see. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We got enough time. Oh, yeah. We got, we got, we got 15 minutes. We we'll go through a couple more examples here. So let's look at two more examples. So they do get more complicated in that sometimes you have to do a bit more work to be able to separate them in the first place. So we're going to have x times y prime minus 3y squared times the natural log of 2x is equal to 0. Um, in my opinion, y prime is never the way I want to write a derivative when I'm trying to separate variables. It's just not useful. So I want to rewrite this as x times dy dx. And I really want the other stuff on the other side. So I'm going to add all this to the other side. We equal 3y squared times the natural log of 2x. Again, I want the y's on the left. I want the x's on the right. So I'm going to divide both sides by y squared and also divide both sides by x. So really, I'm going to divide both sides by x, y squared. And also, of course, I didn't even say it, throw the dx on over to the other side. So let's actually first do that. I'm going to have x times dy equal to 3y squared times natural log of 2x times dx. And then we're going to do the dividing both the side by x, y squared. So I'm going to get dy over y squared equal to 3 times natural log of 2x over x. Dx. We certainly could have brought the 3 over to the other side if we wanted to, but I would always choose to keep the y side as simple as possible. I think that's probably good advice. Probably good advice. All right, we've separated the variables. All the y's are on the left, all the x's are on the right. Now we just have to integrate both sides. Um, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to rewrite this as y to the negative second. And I'm going to pull out the three here and make it the integral of the natural log of 2x divided by x dx. Ooh, the natural log of 2x divided by x. Hmm. U sub? Enrich my parts? It might be U sub. I'm going to pick it is. I know, right? It seems like it might not be. So here's the thing. If you're not sure about U sub versus like which it's going to be, I would always encourage trying the U sub first because it's usually easy. So let's quick try. I'm going to guess. Well, you could be the natural log of 2x. It's a little tricky to see it. And then my du is 1 over the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. Not that we need those twos to cancel out. It'd be fine if it was 1 over 2x. But it's even nicer that du is really just 1 over x dx, which is exactly what we have right there. So this is totally going to become, let's see, the integral of y to the negative second is y to the negative one divided by negative one. And the integral of, well, I should say, this is going to transform into the integral of just u, du, which we can totally do. Um, I'm going to rewrite the left-hand side. Instead of writing it as y to the negative first, I'm writing it as one over y. Instead of divided by negative one, divided by negative one doesn't mean multiplied by negative one, just changing the sign. Let's write this as negative one over y equal to three times the integral of u is u squared over two 
And I'm going to say plus C. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to worry about multiplying that three by the C because again, three times a constant is still just a constant. And then, and then we should plug back in what U is equal to. So we're going to have negative one over Y equal to this one. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just looking at my notes here. I'm like, oh yeah, totally lost the three there. That's fine. Cool. Yeah, there's a three there that got lost in the middle. No worries. So we have three halves natural log of two X squared. Let's see. I know people do that thing where they like do natural log squared of two X. Not a fan personally, but that's just my bias. You can totally write that way if you want. And now we have to solve for Y. Yeesh. So first I would, I would, I would get rid of the negative sign first personally. Multiple both sides by negative one. Yeah, yeah, I would do that. Check it out. I'm gonna have one over y equal to negative three halves natural log of two x quantity squared plus c. Because a constant times negative one is still a constant. Now, finally, we have to invert both sides. So you can literally just take the reciprocal of both sides. So we can say that that means y is gonna equal one over all of that, including the C. So it's going to be negative three halves natural log of two X squared plus C. Kind of gross. Okay. So when you see a differential equation like this and you're being asked to solve it, the first thing to try to do is to see if you can separate variables. What that means is first and foremost, you're gonna want y prime or dy dx by itself. And then after that, you're gonna try and get all the y's on the left, all the x's. Let's do one more. Yeah, we have time for one more. Let's use a different variable. So oftentimes instead of x, we'll use t because a lot of these differential equations are supposed to be representative of like y as a function of time and how things are actually changing. So let's say we have the following differential equation. So we've got y prime over t minus e to the t over y plus one equals zero. And we have an initial condition, which is that y is equal to two when t is equal to zero. Another way people will probably express this is just y of zero equals two. That's the faster way of writing it. So what this means over here, this initial condition, when you see an initial condition, what you should really hear is, that means we have to solve for C. Yeah, cool. Yeah, totally fine. Yeah. Um, so all, all this means is solve for C at the end. Well, so, um, usually, at, I would say solve for C at some point, usually at the end. But sometimes there's a better spot where we solve for C. Oh, not moving enough. It doesn't really matter if it's dark in here, but you might like the lights on. Okay, so if we're trying to solve this using separation, and again, it's not always a guarantee that separation is going to work. It's just the thing I usually try first. I want y prime by itself. So I want y prime over t equal to e to the t over y plus one. And then y prime, or I'm going to write, I'm going to multiply both sides by t and get t e to the t over y plus one. And on the left, instead of writing y prime, I'm going to write dy dy. So here I added e to the t over y plus one to both sides. And here I multiplied by t. And now we're ready to separate. But you can't really start separating until you have dy dt by itself. I know I didn't really do that last time, but it's we kind of did almost. So I want the t's to go to the right. Specifically, the dt is going to multiply on the right, and the y plus one is going to multiply on the left. So we're going to get y plus one dy. And when I write this, I'm really thinking of all of this y plus one as multiplying to dy. It's 
why I'm putting it in parentheses, even though you probably don't really need to. On the right hand side, we're going to get t e to the t dt. And then we're going to integrate both sides. Let's do integral y plus one dy equal to the integral of t e to the t dt. And this integral of t e to the t definitely is integration by parts. So integration by parts. We're going to let u equal t. Vv is going to be the rest. And then du is just one times dt. And v is the antiderivative of e to the t, which is also great, not too terrible. So integrating both sides, we get y squared over 2 plus y. Ooh, oh, that's going to be interesting. Equal to what u times v, so t e to the t minus the integral of v du, which is e to the t dt. So that leads us to y squared over 2 plus y equal to t e to the t minus e to the t plus a constant. Um, it is possible to solve this. It's just kind of super annoying. Um, how much time have we got? We got enough time. So here's what I would say. Actually, so first of all, I would do one more thing. I would multiply both sides by two. So multiply by two. And we're going to get y squared plus 2y equal to t e to 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t plus a new c, which is still c. And this is probably a perfectly good spot to find the constant. So if we plug in t equals 0 and y equal to 2, we're going to get, let's see, on the left-hand side, 2 squared plus 2 times 2 is 4 plus 4. On the right-hand side, we're going to get 0 minus 2 e to the 0, which is just 2 times 1, plus c. So it looks like c is equal to 10. So it's often fine if it's difficult, or sometimes it will be impossible to solve for y. You can leave it implicitly as y squared plus 2y, and it would be equal to 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t plus 1. That would be OK. I will mention you can solve this. It's kind of tricky. You, you can do it one of two ways. I don't want to do it that way. Yeah, there's a really terrible way you could do it. With an so here's the easy way of solving this. Specifically for quadratics. Quadratics you can always solve by using the quadratic formula. Question. Why uh, um, Because I'm, so from here to here, I multiply both sides by two. Just to get rid of that one half. Well, but I, no, I, I multiplied everything by two. So all of this multiplied by two, all of this multiplied by two. So I've got y squared plus 2y plus 2t to the t minus, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, the easy way to solve this, if you want to solve this quadratic, is by completing the square. So check this out. This is not super important, but it's important enough because it might come up. So if I was going to complete the square here, So y squared plus 2y plus something is going to equal 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t plus 10 plus the same something. So what do I need to add to complete the square? I know it might have been a while since we've completed the square. Something people are like, what's that again? Um, you take this coefficient of y, you divide it by 2, and then you square it. And two over two is one, and one squared is one, and that's what we add back. So we're going to add one here. If we add one to one side, we have to add it to the other side as well. Now, why do we do that? Well, because it literally does the thing that it's called. It completes the square on the left-hand side. 
I can rewrite y squared plus 2y plus 1. There's a way to factor that. How does that factor? y plus 1 times another y plus 1. And then the right hand side is 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t plus 11. And if you wanted to solve for y, what would you have to do now? Well, how do we do a square? Yeah. Now, here's where things get a little interesting, I think. This is why, this is particularly why I want this. If you solve, if you solve this, you're going to get y plus 1 equal to plus or minus the square root of 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t plus 11. But the initial condition actually tells us which part we have to pick. Because we were told that y equals 2 when t equals 0. So if you plug in t equal to, oh, that's going to be interesting. Oh, that works out fine. Okay. If you plug in t equal to 0 over here, actually, let's, let's finish all this y before I forget. y is going to equal negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t plus 11. But it can only really be one of these because it should actually be a function. And I'll tell you, it's going to be the positive one in this case. And here's why. If I plug in t equals 0, 2 times 0, in fact, let's just plug in. So if I plug in t equals 0, I get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 0 minus 2 e to the 0 plus 11 e to the 0 is 1, negative 2 plus 11 is 9. So what we really have here is negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 9, which is negative 1 plus or minus 3. But if y has to be 2, it has to be negative 1 plus 3, so that we end up getting the right initial condition. So our actual solution here is y equal to negative 1 plus the square root of 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t plus 1. Cool. So separating variables, oh, 2 over stop. Separating variables, the process is similar every time. You're always trying to bring the y's to the left and the, you know, the x's or the t's or whatever your variable is to the right, and then and integrating both sides. 